Good morning. We are here and we are excited. Um, the Ed Collab gathering is excited to have Elizabeth Lacey Schoenberger. Um, we are happy that you're joining us and we have a wonderful presentation this morning from Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth has a huge wealth of knowledge on urban education. She's been a classroom teacher, professor of English education, a reading specialist, literacy coach, teacher leadership support and design manager, and instructional supervisor at the middle school and college levels. Very impressive. She's done amazing work. She's presented at national conferences and recently published in Teachers and Writers Magazine. And she holds a master's in teaching from Pace University. And she pursues in her spare time, <laughs> somehow she has spare time, uh, creative writing with an independent writing group and devouring young adults in adult fiction. A woman after my own heart and spends time playing with her dogs. I saw them the other day, cutest things you'll ever see. Um, we welcome Elizabeth today. She's gonna to be speaking to you about fostering independence in your classroom in grades three through nine. Um, as you're talking about what you're learning from Elizabeth today, uh, use the hashtag the Ed Collab gathering space number three. And we'd love to see what you're thinking about what you're learning today with Elizabeth. So with no further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Elizabeth. Here we go. Good morning, everyone out there in PD, PJ land. I'm really happy that you're here and that you're joining us today. Um, and I apologize, uh, we're having some technical difficulties, but that's what teaching is all about, is being flexible and working through things. So we're gonna get started this morning. Um, and I want to set the scene because this is a moment that I've lived so often in my life. I start in, I have these grand ambitions of delivering my mini lesson in 12 minutes or less. Um, the kids are going to get started. I have a list of my eight children that I'm going to get to in conference with that day. 16 minutes later, yes, my lesson is delivered. Everyone's going to get started. And I start heading to the first desk, feeling confident, ready to conference and the hands start going in the air. And we all know this feeling as the hands are going in the air. And you look around and you think, well, I, I, can't, I can't not address all these needs. And so we hit the hand and the next hand and the next hand. And before we know it, we have eight minutes left in class and I have conference with one student. So hopefully that's, I'm not the only one in this, in this boat in life. And I um, have done a lot of thinking of how do we get students to a point where they are feeling confident and comfortable and willing to take risks on their own so that we can get the hands down out of the air and get focused in on um, really being able to target and push the students that we want to um, target and push without having to address um, a million concerns. Um, so I want us to sit back and reflect for a second, and then I'm going to give us a lot of strategies and tools um, to really work through how do we scaffold and support things for students so that the hands go down and the learning goes up. So I want us to get started today, and if you'll bear with me for one second and cross your fingers that this is um, going to work for us. And... Hopefully you are seeing my screen, and if, um, Ms. Walsh, if you could just confirm for me that you are. Wonderful, you are. So again, we're talking through fostering independence, um, and as you have questions, thoughts, or ideas about this, if you want to tweet out and let us know, I'll be um, trying to address some of those as we go through. So, think about the last 10 hands you called on in your class. They might sound something like this. My favorite, of course, is the I'm done hand. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the way the, the buckets that needs fall into when um, the hands go up in the air. And I think that they typically fall into three buckets. The basic needs bucket, which we can eliminate very quickly and easily. The what bucket, so what are we doing, where does this go, um, what do I do when I'm done, is this good, um, and then we have this how bucket. The how bucket is really where we want to spend our time conferencing, because the how bucket is um, how do I get from point A to point B, how do I successfully um, you know, do, do what I'm trying to do, those sorts of things. So the how bucket is really where um, we want to be able to spend our time conferencing, so we want to get through a lot of these other questions as quickly and easily as possible. 
I am not going to talk today about eliminating the basic needs. I am just going to quickly highlight for you um, that there's a lot of good stuff out there in the world of education on how to get rid of basic needs questions. Um, I put a couple of images up here for you, and I encourage you, if this is something that's going on a lot, a lot in your class um, where you feel like you're spending time you know, rushing over to a student to help them, and it turns out they just want to sharpen their pencil, um, that you do a little bit of thinking and um, researching around how you um, set up procedures in your classroom so that you don't ever have to have a hand in the air um, for any of the basic needs. Um, so I would encourage you to take some time to reflect on that. I want to push us a little bit further and I want us to get into thinking about the help for the what and how. So when those hands are in the air, the kids are saying, I don't know what to do. Um, I, you know, I was at the nurse, what, what are we doing? That sort of thing that we can really foster some independence through that. And also even build to a point where we're fostering independence around how did you do that? So one thing I like to do when I do the, the help for the what and how is I like to first set the scene for students and um, really build with them this understanding of what it feels like to push through when you feel a little stuck um, and why teachers do this. Um, because I want students to understand when I say, put your hands down, I'm not answering questions, it's not because I'm mean and terrible and don't want to help you. It's because um, I, I want you to really try to start to advocate and figure things out for yourself. So one way I do this is um, I set the scene with the students and I say, today we're going to um, take a little time to try out what it feels like um, to do some different tasks. You're going to work completely independently. I'm not going to help you. And at the end, we're going to talk about what it felt like and how I could better help you in the future. I'm then going to start with a very simple task for the students. I'm going to say, okay, like I said, I'm not answering any questions. Here's your assignment. Go. And I might get them, give them something as simple as what you see on the screen before you. Um, and again, I teach middle school mostly, so this would be something I would do even with seventh and eighth graders. So I might say, you're going to create a list of words that rhyme with cat. You'll have 30 seconds. Think as many as you can. Go. And of course, everyone starts working because everyone can rhyme words with cat. So they work for 30 seconds and we stop. I say, well, how did that feel? Right? How did we do? And of course, students are like, oh, so easy. That was fine. And I say, yeah, that, that's great. OK, I'm going to give you another task to do. Here's task two, complete the following. Now, if you're wondering where I got this task from that you see in front of you on the screen, I googled um, college writing prompts, and I put one up there. I do this on purpose because I want students to take it some time um, to recognize the difference between when you feel stuck and when you don't, when you feel like you don't have enough information um, versus when you feel like you could sort of get started. So I'm not actually going to let students struggle with this for 30 minutes. I'm going to give them maybe two or three. And I'm going to let them observe um, what students do. So some students might actually try to get started on this. Some students might you know, start to put their hand in the air, even though I clearly told them, nope, I'm not answering any questions. Um, some students might just completely you know, throw their pencil down and, and give up completely. When this happens, we're then going to take a step back, and we're going to talk about so how did that feel? How did it go? Um, and then we start brainstorming together. What helped you feel like you didn't need to ask questions during the first activity? So when I asked you to rhyme words with cat, what helped you? And of course, they're going to talk about things like, oh, well, I, you know, we knew we were on the right track. I've done this before. This is something that I know how to do, et cetera. So it's like, yep, of course. So what are some things that could have made the second round feel more reasonable? What are some things you need from me? to allow you to be able to get started when tasks get harder. Hopefully, this is sort of an inquiry activity where they start to come up with the things um, that you're going to start doing in your classroom naturally. Um, so I'm going to then go through with them exactly. Um, I'm going to be like, wow, you're so smart, students. You figured out, like, you really need um, an example from me. You really need um, more practice with um, just smaller parts of this before we do a giant um, task together. You might need some visual aids. You might need um, some sentence starters. So I would work with the students to help them um, establish the list um, of things that, that they might need. I'm also then going to set the purpose as to why I want them to work independently. So I'm going to pose a really important question, which is, why wouldn't I want to answer all of your questions? Why would I want you to try to push through and work independently? Is it just that I'm mean and lazy and don't feel like doing my job? Um, 
And, and we really push and, and do a little thinking around this. What, why is it that we want students to really try to push through and get started and work on their own? Um, and I think this is important because you want the students to trust that everything you do when you work with them is because you believe it's going to help them learn. And it's not because you just want them to pay attention or I'm not going to help you um, kind of thing. So, so you want to set that purpose with them. If you have any thoughts so far about what's jumping out at you, just want to remind you that you can um, tweet out the Ed Club Gathering. You can tweet out um, at Lacey Literacy, um, and we will weigh in on any thoughts or ideas you're having as you're pushing through this. Once we started talking with students about what they need in order to be successful, I really want to spend some time orienting the students and taking them through what within my room can help them know what they need to do. So one thing I always have is up on the um, front board, there's always a section of the board that tells them success today looks like. So if you'll notice what I have, so for today, success today looks like you have a big idea paragraph about a character. And underneath that are the things that make yours successful and good. So you have a big idea paragraph that makes a claim about a character. It uses two to three details from the text, and it explains the connection between the text and the idea. I'm going to post something like this on the board, because we always have those hands that like to go up in the air to say things like, is this good? Am I done? Did I do this right? And I always say, you tell me, is this good? Um, and, and this then gives them sort of a checklist. And this is super helpful, especially for students who might have some um, processing needs or who really work well with some um, extra structure. This is literally a checklist for them to evaluate themselves every day on, did I do what I needed to do to be successful today? You'll notice that in the classroom, right next to my dry erase board where I have what success looks like, I have a big chart that says, before you say, I'm done. Because again, this is my favorite hand in the air, is when the hand goes up and you come over to them and they say, I'm done. And you look down at their work and you're like, you are not done. You haven't, you're not done. Yours doesn't, you're, you're not finished. I want to eliminate the need for me to have to be the person going and telling them that. I want students to really take time to check for themselves. Have they done everything that they needed to do today? Have they really worked through the thought process carefully? So um, I know in the past, teachers like to do things um, like having um, challenge folders and extra activities. So the minute a student says, I'm done, um, we feel the need to hurry and give them a second task to do or a different task to do. Um, but what I've found is that um, I think it's really important for students to have that sort of stop sign first to say, before you say you're done, let's make sure you're actually um, done and you've actually done everything that you need to do. So you'll notice I ask them to do three things. The first thing is I ask them to check back over on the board and ask themselves, did they actually do everything that would make them be successful today? Um, and I actually do have certain students who I make them sort of air, you know, in the air, um, check mark if they did these things. So yes, I have a big ID paragraph. Yes, I have a claim about a character. Yes, I have two to three details. And yes, I explain my connection. So I would have students who I would have them physically, kinesthetically check mark in the air that they did each thing they needed to do. The next thing I'm gonna ask them to do is I'm gonna ask them to compare their work to an example. It might be that I have a piece of my modeled work up on the board for them to look like. It might be that I have an example on a piece of chart paper around the room. Um, it might be that they have a mentor text that they're working off of. Um, but I want them to always compare their work to something else and ask themselves, is mine the same quality as this? And if it's not, what could I do to improve it? So that we're having kids do daily revisions and daily analysis around um, Am I really meeting the standard? Am I really doing high quality and thoughtful work? And if I'm not, what do I need to do to make mine better? The last thing that I would have them do before they can physically fully say they're done and put their, their things away if they want, um, is to ask themselves if they could do more by writing on another topic. So for example, if we're um, writing a blurb, a big idea about a character, could you write about another character? Could you write another big idea? And again, question number three is something I used to spend a lot of time saying to students. They put their hand up, they say, I'm done. And I say, well, could you write about a different character? 
But now this is something that I've started teaching students to do naturally for themselves. I'm going to set this up for them. So could you do more by writing about another character? Oh, yes, I could. Only after they've fully checked through each of these three big idea buckets can they move on to reading independently or for teachers who like to have those challenge folders or, or extra activities, only then can they move on to those things. Okay. The next thing I want to take you into is I want to talk about um, the fact that I often think um, I often think I make these really awesome charts and I hang them up in my room and then I realized that actually what I was doing was making really beautiful wallpaper um, because I realized my students weren't actually using and looking at the charts. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to find ways to stop making wallpaper decorations and start making really useful charts that students would use. Um, and this actually turned out to be some pretty quick and easy fixes. So you'll notice here that in front of the charts, I have a sort of guidepost. So if you need help with writing, look here. Um, before, I used to just assume that students could look through and navigate all the different charts and texts and things I had up and around my room, and they would magically find what I needed them to find. Um, but what I found is that they need more guidance than that to really understand if I have trouble with something, where do I go? So I have these roadmaps. I have writing strategies and support, and I have a section for that. I have reading strategies and support, and a section for that. I have grammatical understandings, and a section for that. And these start to build across the year. You'll also notice that early on in the year, I have a process chart next to an exemplar chart, and that things are really clearly color-coded between the two. In the past, I used to maybe have one or the other. So I would have my process chart up, and I'd be like, remember we talked about it. Your, your big idea um, writings have to have three things. They have to have a big idea, they have to have text, and they have to have analysis. And the thing is, I realized after a while that they would you know, maybe look up that, maybe not, um, but I really wanted them to use it more clearly. So now what I do is I have my process chart, and then I'm going to have an example chart next to it um, for at least probably the first week or two after this chart is really relevant in the room. That way, not only do I have the process chart of what they could do, but I have a clear example of what that looks like. You also notice it's color-coded. This is really um, so that those students who say, like, I think I'm done, and I'll say, well, can you look up here? It looks like... You, you have the, the same part as mine for the, the blue and the pink. It looks like you said, said a big idea, and it looks like you use text details. Do you have anything on your paper that matches what I have up there in red? And by clearly color coding it, that allows, um, that allows students to better sort of zoom in on what it is that they're really trying to um, revise or work on or add to improve. All right, so I'm going to go, I'm going to attempt here for one second to um, come back to the other. Give me one second here. And hopefully that is me popping back up. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you, moderator. So with having those guideposts and having those signs, um, before I turn students loose for independent work, I'm going to actually set them up and have them establish where all they might have to look in the room to figure out what they need. So um, I'm going to say, okay, we're about to get started. It's about to be independent work time. Um, and you know that for the first five to 10 minutes of independent work time, it's figure it out time, which means that I'm not answering any questions um, and I'm not revisiting any directions. Um, it's for you to just get started on your work. In order to do that, what could help you today? Um, and again, um, this links back to having first taught a lesson where we really went through together. Yep, sometimes we struggle, sometimes we need extra help. Um, so what are some things that can help us? Um, and so I would tour guide style go over to my dry erase board and say, so here's the success criteria. So one thing that could help you today is you could look up here and you could make sure you did everything on this list. Here is a writing chart that could help you because we're working on um, writing ideas right now. Here's a writing chart that could help you. So another thing that could help you right now is you could look over here on this wall and you could look through the chart to help you. That's something that could help you right now. Um, and so by giving sort of tour guide style, here are some things that could help you today that allows them a chance to say, oh, okay, I have things in this room that can help me. Um, and then when a hand goes in the air, 
my hand is going to point to the chart, point to the board, and then point back down to their paper. Um, because I want them to really start recognizing there are things in this room other than me um, that can really get you started today and get you going. So five minute figure it out time again um, is something that I like to uh, start early and build. So the first week or two it might be two minute figure it out time. So for the first two minutes of independent work time, um, you all are just working, you're pushing through, um, and my job as the teacher is to observe and see where I can best come and support and help you. So again, establishing that purpose. It's not that I don't want to talk to you. It's not that I don't want to help you. It's that I have to establish that right now the best thing I can do to help you is teach you how to help yourself and teach you how to really think through and help yourself. So that's one thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to say, okay, it's figure it out time. Ready, go. And they know that there's no reason to put their hand in the air because I'm not going to call on them and I'm not going to come over and support them. I'm going to guide them to the things in the room that can support them. I also then want to show you um, that there are oftentimes um, ways to build into our modeling more explicit guidance for students. I remember I used to um, think that I had done this brilliant model. I had put it up on the board. I had talked through, see what I did here, kids? I did this. Isn't that awesome? Okay, go do it. And then I couldn't figure out why they weren't just going to do it. And then I realized that students, um, a, a lot of our students, especially students if they have any sort of um, speech and processing um, you know, needs or if they're struggling with attention and, and paying, um, paying close attention to everything, it might be that while I'm up there modeling, they're still processing and thinking about the model, the actual words on the paper. Asking them to then do that higher inferencing level of, so what did I just do? How did I do that? And what does that mean for you in terms of how you could then go and do that? And I realized that there was a step missing there for students that I could make explicit and visual. And so I started trying to think about how, rather than just giving my students um, blanket sentence starters or sentence stems or rather than giving them prompt questions or things like that. For students that had trouble getting started independently, I could just do things to try to make my model come to life. So I could do this in a couple of ways. One way I could do this is I could actually work um, to pull out what from my model are things that they could explicitly steal and use. Um, this is where I would have showed you on a document camera, but I'm going to try to show you up here because the document camera is not cooperating. Um, so what I would do, what I used to do is I would just model and leave it up here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my beautiful model, but what I'm now going to do is I'm going to highlight the sentence stems that they could also use in their work. So I've highlighted words like the tone of. The author uses words like, these words are. And I'm going to highlight those so that students can look up and instead of just seeing my model sitting there all by its, its beautiful self, they actually, I can say, look at my highlighted words. Those are words that you could steal and use in your writing. This helps them have a better connection between my model and their work because what I was finding is when I was giving students um, sentence starters and sentence stems and things like that, um, that they were seeing a disconnect between this typed nice neat list of um, sentence stems and what was going on with the processing work we were doing as a class um, for the model. And so what I found was um, to, to start embedding my sentence stems and starters for them in my model, but then pulling them back out by highlighting highlighting them, by annotating them, by doing things so that those students who are still sort of processing the words of the model can then have a chance to go back and process the sort of how did you do that, what is that going on. I'm going to show you another way that you could annotate a model for your students. Um, so we like to do a lot of things um, online now. I love using um, Google Docs and things like that, and I like um, giving the kids a chance to really, uh, you know, work online. And um, I wanted to find a way to try to bring to life um, what I was doing. Again, it's this how. And what I used to do is I used to do that just by talking through it. But what I found is that I want to be a little bit more explicit with my students. So I might do something like this. This is a short excerpt from um, my modeling around starting a realistic fiction story. 
And in the past, what I might have done is leave this up there and then say, okay, ready? Go get started and draft. And then they're sitting there, and, and my favorite question of all time is, how? I don't know how to get started. Um, so what I might do is I might have my Google Doc, and I might highlight this first sentence in one color of highlighter. And I'm going to actually insert a comment. And as a class, we're going to talk together and we're going to say, okay, guys, what did I do here? It says the basement was full of cobwebs and burned out light bulbs. What did I do? And the students will say, oh, you're describing something. Yep, that's what I did. So I described um, setting. That's what I'm doing in that first sentence. Is that something you could do in your draft when you get started? Yes, awesome. Now I'm going to highlight this next sentence. I'm going to highlight it in a different color. And I'm going to insert a new comment. And I'm going to say, what did I do in this next sentence? This is Amber wrinkled up her nose and she sighed. What is that? Yeah, I'm describing the action of a character. So you could have a character, um, you could describe action. Another way I might explain this to students is I would say, have your character do something. Right? And then I could keep going. So here we go. This is my next line. It says, this is so boring, Ricky moaned. What am I doing there, guys? And I'm going to highlight that in a third color. Oops, not that one. That's not easy enough to see. I'm going to highlight it in green because blue is hard to see here. And I'm going to insert a comment here. And I'm going to say, there's, we, I would use dialogue, right? So, there's, so another thing we can do is we have dialogue. Or another way of saying that is um, have your character say something. Right? So this is a great way um, to try to really annotate and bring to life what you do in your model so that those students who are looking up at your model and saying, but I don't know how I could possibly do that. I don't know what you did there. I'm not sure what that means would have a chance to really look up a name, right? Because what I realized is that what this is, these comments out to the side, my little sidebar notes, what I realize these are is I realize that these are actually higher level, it's, it's that inferencing work, right? So it's, it's that moment. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, bring my, trying to bring my screen share background so I can wrap up here. Okay, you got it, am I on? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so what I realized um, before was that I, um, I was leaving that higher level inferencing work, that analysis of author's craft, as it were, if I, if I may call myself an author here, I realized that I was leaving that analysis of author's craft up to the students to do on their own. So that work of reading my first sentence that says, um, the basement was dark and full of cobwebs, that higher level inferencing work is saying, what is that author's craft move there? What am I doing? Oh, I'm describing the setting. And so what I've now realized is that by annotating that, doing that together with the class before I turn them loose to get started on their own, um, makes a huge difference in the number of kids that then feel empowered to be able to get started and do what they need to do. So in the past, that would look like me saying to them, what, what did I do here? Yes, I started by describing the setting, and then I moved into character action. And I would say that out loud for the students as part of my modeling. But what I wasn't doing was actually bringing it back and making that visually very clear and simple for them. Um, I always used to envy the math teachers because um, it seemed so much easier to uh, just have step one, step two, step three, step four. And it's not that I want ELA to feel, um, you know, that structured and rigid as if there's steps and rules that have to be followed. But what I do want to do is to make as clear as possible to students that um, it's, you can get started on this. Here's some things that you can do to get started. Here's some words you can borrow. Here's some examples you could build from. Here's some um, craft moves you could try. Um, and again, just making that part as explicit and visual for students as possible rather than trying to sort of leave them to break all that down on their own. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up now, um, if I can. <laughs>
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here for you. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica. But what I would encourage you to do is just um, really start thinking about ways that you can bring to life and make the abstract as concrete as possible for students um, so that they really feel empowered to get started on their own and that they understand my job here isn't to answer your simple questions about what are we doing, how do I get started. My job is to look at what you've done and then really build on that into something more powerful. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Jessica now. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and please feel free to connect with me on Twitter, reach out, I'd love to brainstorm and hear ways that you make your students more independent. I'd love to hear questions that you have. So I look forward to communicating with you further. Thank you. Thank you, oh my gosh, that was awesome. I know we had a rough start with tech issues, but I learned so much from you today. Um, those explicit strategies, that check in the air, um, getting that kinesthetic in there with the kids. Um, the fact that charts, and I always felt like this as an ELA teacher as well, those charts end up becoming just beautiful wallpaper. How do we actually get kids to use those um, in a way that's meaningful for them? And then the idea of why. Why, are we, why am I teaching you this? Why is it important for you to be independent? Um, the fact that we're not, it's not that we don't want to help them, but that we want them to make those authors craft decisions themselves for those moments when we aren't there in the classroom for them to help those, help them make those decisions. So um, I know I'm coming away with so much that I can use and share um, in my own classroom. So thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. Um, and for those of you joining us, if you were unable to see the beginning of the um, presentation, the entire thing is going to be um, saved and archived for you. Um, I'm going to rewatch it again and glean even more learning from it. So um, what I'd like to do as well is move forward and show you what we have on our um, upcoming sessions. So um, let me go ahead and pull up. Um, let's see here. Let's pull up our picture. Um, our upcoming sessions in session two, uh, we have a uh, Workshop number five with Jillian and Teresa. I'm white, so now what? Making a place for conversations around race in schools. Um, we've got workshop number six with Maggie Beatty Roberts, being your favorite teacher, exploring the art of great teaching. And we've got workshop number seven with Stephanie, Heidi, Kathy, and Suzanne, building a virtual learning network for professional learning. Those sessions are gonna start at 12 Eastern. Um, you can go back to the agenda at a glance page on the Ed Cole Lab site and um, find the links to those videos there. So again, thank you so much today, Lisa, uh, Elizabeth, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing um, your future work and continuing to learn from you. So thank you for everything you've shared with us today, um, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.